All right. I have word from the tower that we are live. So tonight, hopefully all of you are here to see some blood, guts, and gore, because that's what we got for you. Actually, we have wounds. And if you have horses, you know that horses are nothing but creatures looking for a way to get a fun and creative wound in a place that will give you heart failure as an owner. So tonight, we're going to go through some assessment, treatment, and aftercare for wounds. And if you've got questions, pop them down below. We will ask them as the, the seminar is going. Uh, and if you've got questions afterwards, like if you're coming on to this and it's tomorrow or the next day or whatever day, uh, you can put them down below and we'll try to get them answered after the fact as well. So without further ado, let's talk about horses and wounds. We're going to start with assessment. And we're going to start with some pretty basic stuff. Number one, take pictures of wound. Do not do anything else. Take pictures of what horse has done to itself. You're going to send those pictures to our emergency line, which is 352-474-5007. This is where we're going to start. Step two will be give those a second to come through, then call us. If it's during the day, you can call the clinic. If it's after hours, you can call the emergency line. But you are not going to do anything until after you do those things because you never know if badness isn't going to ensue. We're going to go over a little bit of that, a little bit of that next. So, all right, lacerations and what not to do to start. Don't put anything in the wound. Don't put anything on the wound other than water. And don't let the wound get dirty. So there are a variety of lotions and potions out there that come in colors like red and blue coat and yellow furacin. Don't do it. Don't do any of it. If it's not water, just walk away and say to yourself, I'm not going to do it because Dr. Latcher said so. Do not remove anything from the wound. This is a hard one. For, and it's particularly hard in examples like this, where you've got a foot involved. Your horse has stepped on a nail and you want nothing more than to take that nail out. When you do that, you take away valuable information for us that you'll see where it's useful later. That's why we're starting with just don't touch it, take a picture, call us, and we're going to move forward from there with you. We need to know where this is and we need to take radiographs to do that. Once you take that nail or wire or screw out of there, we can't take a radiograph and find out where it was, so we can't see if important structures were affected. Okay. Now that we know what not to do, we're all clear. We're not going to do those things. We're going to start with some wound basics. We're going to start with how dirty is it. So the wound, <coughs> the wound on the left, very, very, very dirty. Could also have some important structures affected in it, but we've got to get it clean. So you can certainly start with that wound after you've called us and we've told you, we're going to tell you, start running water on that while we work on getting to you. Or at the very least, we're going to try to get that wound cleaner before we move on to bandaging it when you put it on the trailer and bring it to us. But we need to get that wound cleaner, and water is going to start that process. So we're going to get it water, 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 lots and lots and lots of water. The wound in the middle on the face is a bit dirty. It's not horrendous. But certainly, we can hose that one down as well. It's a little bit trickier spot. But you can wipe that one down. What you want to make sure is that this horse doesn't go out into a nice sandy area and roll and get that wound dirtier. So that wound, we're going to work on getting it cleaned up a little bit. You don't need tons and tons of water for that. But we're going to make sure the horse doesn't get it dirtier. The wound on the right, super clean. You can actually see that this horse has been hosed. Um, this wound was pretty clean even before that. So that is how we want a wound to look before we actually start working on it for the treatment phase of things. But you assessing how dirty it is and getting ready to start applying water is, is vital to things. Our next question is often, how old is it? And we get a variety of answers to this. Um, the one on the left, that one happened probably within the last four to five hours to this horse. Uh, it happened overnight sometime, and this is how the owner found it at seven in the morning. 
but we can see that there isn't a lot of swelling uh, to the leg. There's, you know, there's tissue kind of pulled apart, but there isn't a ton of swelling. It looks like there's been a knife taken to that leg, which it was barbed wire, but it looks like there's been, you know, kind of a straight cut to it. And we're just looking at tissue poking out at us versus the wound on the right has a very healthy granulation bed, which we're also going to talk about later here. But that wound has been healing for a really, really, really long time. So the wound on the left is an emergency and we need to deal with it absolutely right away. The wound on the right, we can send some pictures, we can work on making an appointment and we can move forward with how we need to deal with that. That one's been going on for quite a few weeks at that point to have that much granulation tissue. The next question is, we need to get your horse near water. So can your horse be moved? So your horse is the red dot next to the red arrow here, not the one conveniently located up front because the horse near the barn would never hurt itself. It has to be the horse all the way out in the field, way, way, way in the back. This is again, where it's vital that you talk to us before you do this. Some of these horses, we're gonna tell you, don't move them. We have things going on that we're worried that you should not be moving them. You shouldn't be working on cleaning the wound. You shouldn't be doing anything. And again, this is where it's vital. What you can do uh, while you're waiting for us to arrive and help assess this horse, if it's one we say can't be moved, is you can be working on how can I get a horse trailer to this location? Because our goal is going to be to get this horse from where it is to either our hospital or maybe a referral hospital or your barn, depending on how bad things are. Um, but we need to do that without them having to walk from the seven miles away from anything that they did. So we're gonna be trying to figure out, can we get a horse trailer to this location? And sometimes we can't, but our goal is to always evaluate, can we? Is there blood? There's always blood of some sort, but we wanna know, is there blood? Or is there blood? If there is active spurting, running, <laughs> copious amounts of blood moving like a waterfall, we're going to be going over with you guys how to do a tourniquet on that area, if at all possible. So you do not want to do that again without guidance because you can actually harm structures. So having uh, some rubber tubing, I like to have uh, TheraBands work for this, you know, the resistance bands that you probably have somewhere that you don't actually use because um, you got them one year around New Year's. Um, so having those, they can work as tourniquets. But if there's copious amounts of bleeding, again, you're going to take pictures and call us. But in the meantime, you may be looking, have, sending someone else off to look for some tourniquet materials. If there's small amounts of bleeding, Small is a relative term. My small and your small, I promise, are two different amounts. But if there's oozing, you know, if there isn't blood pooling on the ground, then you don't need to worry about any of that. Um, again, you're just going to take pictures, send them to us, and we're going to formulate a plan. The next place we're going to go is to bandage or not to bandage while you're looking at this horse out in the field. If there's copious amounts of bleeding, we're going to work through with you on getting a tourniquet onto it. Um, and then from there, for most wounds, if at all possible, I like to get a bandage onto them until we get there. It helps keep them clean. Um, in some ways, it can help us get them clean if they're dirty. But the way that I like to do that is diapers. I hear you can put them on small humans, but I've never experienced that. Mostly I use them for wounds on horses, but the, the lining does a really great job of not sticking to wounds and they're absorbent. So they do a lot of things for us. Um, they're also conveniently packaged where normally you can have them in lots of places and they stay clean. Um, so I am always ready with some diapers, uh, some vet wrap or similar to wrap that onto the area. And if all else fails, uh, Gorilla Tape, because I really like Gorilla Tape because it sticks to anything and works better for me than generic duct tape. So having these three things available in an emergency kit is key. If it's a place you can bandage, in general, I would say you're never wrong to bandage it, and we're probably going to tell you to. So you can also, while we're working on getting there, be working on getting that together. So a little bit about our assessment as well is we are going to look at where is this wound and you're going to be surprised sometimes when you send us those pictures and you send us that wound on the right hand side that's tiny and we freak out 
That wound is into a very important structure. I can go over those in a second. But that is a life-threatening wound, whereas the giant wound on the left that is just incredibly gory, probably not life-threatening. Going to be a pain in the butt to sew up and keep together and heal. But unless it goes actually into the abdomen, as horrible as that looks, it is less scary for us as veterinarians than the teeny tiny wound on the right. And we're going to go over uh, how wounds heal in a bit. But that teeny tiny wound on the hawk is terrifying for us. And this is why. So screenshot this image right here. And if your horse has even the tiniest thing in any of the red and yellow areas, we're, we're concerned, like we are really concerned. I once had a horse that had a pinprick injury, like teeny tiny on the back of its pastern. It went into one of those tendon sheaths, actually it was on a hind foot. It was right, I don't know if you guys can see my, my cursor, but it was right there. It was the tiniest wound. And it went into that tendon sheath and it became a career ending injury for that horse. Even though the owner found it right away, the owner did everything that needed to happen. The, sep the tendon sheath got infected, which is what we worry about. The horse lived, but because of that infection, it could never compete again. And this was a high level horse. So that is why we get really scared when an injury is anywhere near one of those things. And we get less scared when they've taken off their entire thorax. Yep, those are, like I said, they're going to take a while for us to suture back together. But in the moment, they're not life-threatening like one of these are. And what that this is also why we want to make sure we don't pull anything out of, in particular, feet. So you can see on this image, we've got nails going everywhere. Some of those nails are worse than others. And if they're into many of these structures, hopefully you can see my cursor again, um, if we're down here, we're okay. We're going to have a sore horse, but we're not going to have a dead horse. Versus if we're up into these areas, we are affecting structures that get infected really easily and we can't treat really easily. So it's a very different scenario for what we do in the moment on those horses that have nails or screws in their feet that go into one of these structures. So if we've got big deals, our joints, tendon sheaths, or bursa, and again, those are on that, that previous slide, any of the red or yellow areas, big, big, big deal. Bone, we can have some secondary issues with. Um, tendons and ligaments don't like to heal great because they don't have any blood vessels. And we want to remember that even if the horse has a tiny wound or isn't lame and it's in one of those spaces, it can be a really, really, really bad thing. So the big thing on assessment is, what did we learn? We're going to take pictures. We all have a thing. Well, it's not in my pocket right now. We all have a thing in our pocket that takes pictures. Take a lot of them. Take videos. Take more than you ever thought you needed to take. It's fine. You're going to send those to the emergency line. You're going to be ready to bandage the wound. You're going to be ready to get the horse near water if you need to, but you're going to wait to talk to us for all of that before you move on. So without further ado, we're going to go on to what we're going to do when we get there and how we're going to treat it with Dr. York. All right. Hey, guys. I love talking about wounds. I really enjoy treating wounds. I know you don't enjoy having a wound on your horse, but they are very fun to see come back together again for me. So uh, I like this topic a lot. Um, so we're going to talk briefly to begin with about the several types of wounds that your horse can sustain uh, and what kind of things you'll see when we have those categories. So to begin with a contusion, I don't have a picture of a contusion on here. Basically think about it as your horse got kicked by another horse or you went to a bar and got punched in the eye by somebody. Uh, so it's not, it's not a cut, it may not even bleed, um, but it's blunt force trauma. Usually there's gonna be a bruise or maybe a hematoma, big you know, blood bruise underneath it. Uh, an abrasion is the top picture there on the right. It's kind of a scrape. So you're not in deep, you're just scraped across the surface of the skin. Uh, an avulsion uh, or a degloving injury is where you're basically peeling the skin off of what's underneath. So 
So, so peeling the skin down, you can see they are in that bottom picture. Uh, the skin is just peeled off, uh, but the underlying structures are intact. An incision, uh, I don't have a picture of that. Think about it as that as a surgical wound or a horse that very, very carefully cut himself with a nail on a fence. So a clean, straight cut caused by a sharp object. Usually there's not a lot of collateral damage uh, around it and can be pretty simply put back together depending on where it is. Uh, laceration is probably the most common thing you're gonna see and we're gonna deal with. So it's, uh, it's a cut, but it's very irregular. There's a lot of tearing going on. Uh, you can see that in the top right picture. And then a puncture wound. We don't like puncture wounds. They don't look like a big deal, but they are a big deal. Uh, so they go in, you know, different depths. They can go quite deep sometimes. Uh, and then they bring whatever's on the object with them or the hair or the dirt that's on the skin. So they don't look like a big deal from the outside, but they can go into some pretty important areas and make things really dirty on the inside. So we do see a lot of puncture wounds too. How we're going to treat a wound depends on what kind of wound it is. This slide look familiar? I put it back in again because it's that important. So like Dr. Latcher said, there's a ton of different areas we call synovial structures. Uh, joints are synovial structures, tendon sheaths are synovial structures, and so are bursae. Uh, basically what a synovial structure is, is like a closed system. Think about it as like a water balloon, uh, where the stuff on the inside of the water balloon is inside the joint or inside the tendon sheath, and it's got synovial tissue, which is that joint tissue. Um, the big deal with those is how much of a problem they are if they get infected. So something in the muscle may look really dramatic, uh, we can clear that uh, infection up really easily. An infection inside any synovial structure is a really big deal. So look at this picture, take a screenshot like Dr. Latcher said, and if you remember nothing else from this lecture, this is the one I want you to remember. So if you have even the smallest of cuts in this location, make sure to give us a call ASAP. So when we have a cut, laceration, wound of any sort, in one of those areas that were red or yellow, one of the first things we're going to do is determine, did it go into that synovial structure? Because you can have a, an injury that's near, but not right in. So our first step before we start suturing, before we even choose what, what antibiotics we're going to give, before we decide what hospital you're going to go to, if you have to go to a hospital, is to determine, is the wound into the synovial structure? And there's a couple ways to do that. Um, you can see in the picture on the right, there's a little sample of fluid. So basically what we've done is we sterilely prepped the, let's say the joint, for example, um, on a different site than where the wound is. So like on the back of the joint instead of right where the wound is on the front. And we take a sample of the fluid that's in there and we could send that for culture. We can see what it looks like grossly, see how gross it is. Uh, and then another thing we can do is we can distend the joint. So think about a, a water balloon. If I have a, a normal water balloon, all the water stays inside the water balloon. But if I have a, a wound into the water balloon, I may see synovial fluid leaking out of it. And for sure, if I put a, uh, like a hose into the open part of the water balloon and pressurized it, I'd then have fluid coming out if there was a pin prick into it, right? So think about a water balloon. I've got a, the hose attached. It's filling up the water balloon, and I've got a pin prick into that, which is the wound. It's going to be spurting out, just like this picture here of this horse's fetlock. So the fluid coming out here, which is the actual wound, is being sent in through this line in the back, and that joint is being pressurized like a water balloon being filled up. If the wound is into the joint, it's going to come out the wound, or yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so that fluid that I put in is going to come out the wound. If the wound does not involve the, the joint itself, when I fill up that um, joint, that water balloon, it's just going to get more and more and more full. Nothing's going to come out. All right, so that's called distending a joint. So provided I don't have any evidence that the wound is into the joint itself or the tendon sheath or the bursa, uh, we're just going to deal with wound healing. So if we don't have the scary stuff, we're going to deal with wound healing. Um, before I go on to this next one, I should talk briefly about what do we do if we are in a, in a joint or any of the synovial structures. Uh, the biggest thing is we need to flush that out. Um, gold standard for treatment is going to be sending you down to one of the referral hospitals for a um, like a high volume lavage uh, in surgery so the horse is very often anesthetized for this put a large volume of fluid uh, through the, um, the the joint in a sterile situation and you can also look in there with uh, with an arthroscope to see is there any hair is there any gross debris is there anything else going on in the joint and clean those out okay it can be extremely helpful yeah we have a question Uh, 
Um, I, I wouldn't do anything yet. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the question is, if you have a puncture wound, and I'm taking this as before the vet comes, right? So if you have a puncture wound, should you shoot any water into that puncture wound to flush it out? I wouldn't. I would just lavage the surface of it. Let me explore it. Let me see where it goes before you put anything in. Because if you kind of pressurize anything in and it goes anywhere deeper, that could cause a bigger problem than when we started with. So let me take a look at it. If I'm satisfied that there's nowhere worse it's going to go, I'm probably going to lavage it out with some antiseptic. Uh, but I would just have you run water on the surface to start with. Okay, so um, so if we have the joint infection, we're going to send you for a higher level of care than you would just need if you had a laceration just into the skin, the muscle, that sort of thing. So um, let's talk about now what wounds heal well and which ones don't. So head and neck are our, you know, like front of the classroom, a student, do the right thing, always, uh, always usually do nicely anyway. Uh, so head and neck do really, really well, even if they look very gory to start with. Uh, so they have good blood supply. They've got a lot of tissue underneath the skin. So if you think about the neck of your horse, there's a lot of muscle underneath. There's a lot of uh, uh, you know skin you can freely move. So they've got a good blood supply because of that. They heal fast. They're resistant to infection, again, because of that blood supply. And they have a great cosmetic outcome, even if they start out looking horrendous. Okay, So usually, even if it's a, a laceration on the face or the or the chest or the neck start out looking really, really scary, you will barely be able to tell. And so this is a case we worked on uh, last year that's pretty good evidence of that. Uh, so this sweet little donkey was attacked by a dog uh, really badly, uh, mauled on both sides of her face. Um, what you're seeing on the picture on the left is the initial wound when we first saw it. That tissue was so damaged and it basically became necrotic. So we actually lost a lot of tissue. It wasn't just cuts. The whole tissue was damaged, lost blood supply, uh, kind of a lot of it fell off. Uh, so the picture in the middle here is in the hospital mid-treatment. Uh, we have some healthier tissue coming up from underneath, but you can see how much tissue was lost in the process. Um, there's actually a hole. If you can see under the halter, there's an entire hole right in here into the horse's mouth, uh, the donkey's mouth. And in the lower lip, I don't have it in this picture, but you can barely see it. Uh, there's there's like a, a hole, like a piercing, right through the bottom of the jaw uh, or the bottom of the lower lip. So uh, pretty impressive, right? Very gory. This is her uh, this week. So you could barely tell that this was the donkey that was involved. Uh, so heads heal beautifully. They'll make me look like a hero. All right. On the other hand, uh, which body parts don't? Legs. Now, unfortunately for horses, legs are pretty important. So this is problematic. The reason legs don't do well, they don't have a lot of blood supply. Think about your horse's legs. There's bone and there's a very small amount of tissue and then there's skin on top. Not a lot in between. They don't have a leg like an elephant. They've got very, very spindly little legs built for speed, not built for healing well. So bl poor blood supply because we don't have all that muscle down in the lower leg. We've got a lot of joints, tendon sheets, bursa, um, we have skin under tension. So think about your horse's chest, for example, or, your, or his neck. There's a lot of free skin. You can move it around. Uh, and then think about his leg. There's not a lot of extra skin. So when there's not extra skin and we've lost some skin, the laceration, there's not a lot for me to be able to bring together and, and suture. Uh, there's a lot of joints, of course. Your horse moves his legs. He jumps. He runs. He has a lot of flexion in his, uh, in his legs. So the problem with that is that we need him to stay very still for wound healing. That's very hard to accomplish in legs. Contamination. He stands near his poop. So there's a lot of manure that's always around, a lot of dirt that's always in a horse's environment. Uh, it's just very easy for that to get contaminated. And slower skin growth. So anything on the trunk, the head, the, the back, the face, will heal in the skin about five times as fast as they will on legs. So very, very slow process on the legs. And if we do develop a scar, Depending on the location of that scar, it can impede the, uh, the normal flexion of the horse and impede his ability to do his job if there's lack of flexibility in his legs. So this video um, shows you the location of the fetlock joint underneath this laceration. So if you look at the, the thing I'm pushing there, and I'm going to start it again, um, you see how we're pushing what looks like a little water balloon? That's the fetlock joint. You can see how little skin there is between the outside world and the fetlock joint. So this horse was very, very lucky, uh, lacerated right up to the fetlock joint, but not into it. So we just had to deal with the healing of the wound itself, not actually the, the joint itself. But you can see how darn close that is.
Okay, so how does a wound heal? Um, I'm not gonna go into the very depths of, of wound healing because it's very complicated and frankly boring. So we're gonna talk about the, the real basics of what happens um, in the three phases. Uh, the inflammatory phase starts the minute the horse gets cut. So we're talking about uh, clotting, hemostasis. So stopping the bleeding and then starting the inflammation that uh, takes away all the dirt, all the debris, all the necrotic tissue and sets it up for the next stage, which is actually creating new tissue. So in proliferation, we're creating more blood vessels, we're creating uh, more tissue, and by that I mean granulation tissue, you know, muscle will start to be built, uh, subcutaneous tissue, uh, and then skin begins. Um, now I'm gonna stop for a second, I wanna go through the, the types of tissue you're seeing in these pictures. So you see all the bumpy stuff in the middle of this top picture? Same thing in the, in the bottom picture here, but this is a kind of a, a more moist and, and fresh looking wound. So this is granulation tissue. It looks like pink cobblestone, very bumpy, bleeds very easily. Um, so that is an important type of tissue is what a wound initially starts filling in with. Um, granulation tissue is made of collagen, made of little skin cap or little capillaries. So it's got that bumpy texture, bleeds very easily if you touch it, um, but it's very, very useful stuff, very good, uh, very resistant to infection. So when I start to see that coming in, I'm really happy. Um, now, one thing it can tell me is how long that wound's been there. So granulation tissue starts at about four or five days. So if you call me out and you say this wound happened last night and there's granulation tissue in there, I know you're fibbing. So that's granulation tissue. And then what we have around the edge here, look at the pink skin, the light pink border here around the edge of this wound, it kind of spikes up here. Um, that's the actual skin cells that are growing in and they're gonna grow in from the skin on the outside towards the middle. They're gonna grow over that granulation tissue uh, towards the center. So in this bottom wound here, this is the granulation in the middle and right along the border, that light pink edge, that's the skin cells. So those are the little guys that are actually gonna come together and heal the wound. We wanna protect them in the aftercare. Uh, the remodeling phase is the third phase, and it's when healing tissue regains strength. So you can have a wound that's covered over, but it's not that strong until the remodeling is done. Um, these phases are happening all at once, basically. So it's not one and then two and then three. It's everything happening all at once. Um, they kind of cross over each other. How long the whole thing takes totally depends on the wound. So it might be two weeks, it might be a year, very dependent on how bad the wound was. All right, so once we've, uh, we've come out, we've assessed the wound, uh, we've made sure it's not in the joint, uh, we've taken a look at the general area that it is, uh, we're gonna start by actually preparing the wound to, uh, to be able to, to treat and suture. So we'll clip the wound, we'll clean it, uh, usually some combination of um, antiseptic solution and water or saline lavage, um, and then debridement or debridement. Um, so debridement is basically removing the tissue that's either very contaminated or necrotic, doesn't have any blood supply, and isn't gonna be part of the whole wound healing. So we wanna get rid of that because all it's gonna do is impede the body from being able to start the actual healing itself. So that stuff has to go because it's a risk of infection and it's a, um, it takes more time for the body to get rid of it itself before it can start the healing. Um, several different ways to do that. We won't go into super depth. Um, sharp uh, debridement is when we just take a scalpel and we remove the, the dirty parts or the, the uh, devitalized parts of the wound. Um, there's other types of debridement that involve chemicals, that involve uh, pressurized saline. Um, and one really fun way is down here on the, on the bottom, you can see maggots. Uh, so these are sterile medical maggots and they're very useful in some types of wounds if there's a lot of necrotic material and uh, you need to create a fresher, more uh, like living wound in order to, to start healing. Um, these little maggots can be really great at helping to remove the gross stuff so that the body can start over in healing fresh. So we'll talk about um, types of skin closure now. Um, I'm gonna talk just about skin. We may have other layers. We may be closing some muscle layers. We may be closing subcutaneous, but basically this is the skin. This is once we get to the surface layer. Uh, so a primary closure is if I have a nice, fresh, clean, clean wound, I've got a, a sharp incision, something where I can bring the skin together, uh, and I've got good blood supply, and I've got a pretty clean area, so I can just come out and immediately close your horse's uh, uh, laceration. And I've got enough skin to be able to do that. I can bring it together. A delayed primary closure we may use especially if there's a very contaminated wound or it's a wound where I'm worried that there's a synovial structure involved 
uh, or there's very severe trauma. So if we have something that looks really gross, basically and doesn't look like it's healthy enough to hold the, the sutures immediately, or I need to prove that the tissue is healthy enough to, to be able to close over, uh, we might choose a delayed primary. So, so this is, you give it a couple days of wound care and, and treatment, and then you close it uh, before the granulation tissue starts. So usually this is between two and five days. Um, and we usually freshen the wound a little bit, do a little bit of debridement before, um, before we actually close it. So that's delayed primary, but basically the goal is to suture it together just like primary. Secondary closure is closing the wound, but it's after the granulation tissue is already formed. So this is over five days. So in a chronic wound, a very contaminated wound, something with a lot of severe trauma, again, uh, we'll give it more time and then we'll close it up. Uh, a lot of times if you have a wound that just won't heal, there's a lot of granulation tissue and it keeps cracking open, that sort of thing, you can, you can promote the wound being able to heal by taking it back to where it started, removing that granulation tissue, and then suturing it together. So, so this one in this top picture, you can see all this granulation tissue. This wound it just wasn't going anywhere in terms of healing. It would just wouldn't stay together. The horse would continually re-injure itself. Uh, so we took that horse back to the skin edges, removed the granulation tissue, and sutured it, uh, and then it helped uh, actually successfully heal. And sometimes you just don't have enough skin to close. So second intention healing is where there's a large amount of skin that's been lost. There's no way I can bring enough skin together to close that. So uh, we're going to treat this as an open wound and just allow it to, to uh, be cared for and have that skin grow in from the edges. And we'll talk about some other options uh, for this in a minute, too. So what if you don't have enough skin? It, it can range from I, I almost have enough skin and I just need a little bit more uh, to bring it together to I really, really don't have any skin to use. Um, so if I, if I have skin that's just under tension and I'm really working to bring it together and be able to suture it, there's some easy things we can do in terms of uh, choosing our suture pattern that will just help that suture hold and not be as much strain against them that, that would cause them to pop out after we fix it. So picture here, you can just see this is a certain type of suture pattern uh, called a horizontal mattress, and it just helps to, to take a little tension off the skin. Um, another method of doing that on the right, you can see that this horse has fancy buttons on it. Uh, so because there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of motion in this area, the buttons help to support the suture in the skin so that there's less pressure on the edges of the skin and less likelihood that the suture is going to rip out uh, through the skin. So another tension relieving technique. And then if I have Really, you know, not enough to bring it together, but I want to close the, the primary wound here in the center. Uh, this is a mesh expansion technique where you can make small incisions on the sides of the primary incision, and those gap a little bit and just let you close the more important incision in the middle. And then all these little wounds will fill in quite quickly and heal um, on their own, like, like small incisions. So... If I have that wound where there's a large area and a lot of skin missing, and I think it's going to take a really, really long time for that skin to fill in, uh, and also if it's an area that might be problematic, like a lower limb, if I don't have skin for a long time, there's a couple techniques we can use. So skin grafting is where we take little, well, there's a variety of ways, but one of the most common ways is taking little islands of skin and implanting them into the granulation tissue bed so that they can start growing. Each little island gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and they all coalesce in the end into one um, covered area with skin instead of having to wait for the edges to grow all the way in. And remember, that can take forever in a, in a lower leg. So we take uh, these little uh, round punches, like a little hole punch almost. Uh, typically, this is done right below the mane. So on the horse's neck right below the mane where you don't really see them and they heal well anyway, you pull them out of there, you prepare the wound bed in the, in the lower leg, and you plant them back in. Um, not every single one of these takes, but if you're, if you're lucky, you get a good, you know, 75% success rate and they will grow and they'll just vastly increase the speed that that wound can heal because they're each growing from each separate island. And then there's other techniques like skin mobilization that we could use if we have to either take care of a wound or in this example, uh, remove a tumor. 
and we want to create uh, in this horse here an eyelid margin. Uh, eyelids are, are really important. The horse has to have a solid eyelid margin to be able to blink, otherwise they have a lot of problems with the eyeballs. So uh, this is an example of using skin mobilization to create the most important part of the, of the horse's anatomy um, and being able to use skin from somewhere else. So in this flap, what we're doing, here, here's the tumor here, uh, and it extends all the way from this side all the way to here and a little bit here. Um, the important thing, of course, as you guys know in, in tumors is that you can't just take right up to where the tumor is. You have to take margins on the other sides of it so that you don't leave any cancer cells in there. So you have to take a much larger area than it looks like you need to. Uh, so for this horse, what we did is down here. The yellow is the, the skin itself, the circle is the tumor area, and the, the red translucent area is the skin that was removed. So we take a big rectangle around this tumor, about like this, um, and then also make incisions into the skin going, going down, and then take out little triangles of skin as well. And then that flap, it's an advancement flap, gets pulled up, like pulling a sheet up on a bed, uh, to where this border here is now making up your eyelid margin. So you can see in the middle picture, the skin that is now the eyelid margin was the skin that started out down here. And then the picture on the right is that horse um, is several weeks after surgery. I don't remember exactly what, but um, you know you can see he's he's still got a little bit of a of a scar there, but he's got a solid eyelid margin now. Another uh, type of skin mobilization, um, another horse with a tumor on its eye, squamous cell carcinoma on its eye. This is a pretty big one, and I didn't have enough skin to do the advancement flap like in the previous slide, so this is a skin rotating flap. So you can see there's a large amount of uh, the tissue that has to come out here to remove all the tumor. What we did was took the skin from lower down on the cheek, so removed the skin from here. This piece here was originally down lower, and then brought that skin up to make a, a margin, and then sutured it in this bottom picture here at the front of the eye and at the side of the eye, and left this bottom part to heal. I'm not worried about the bottom part. That can heal by itself. Um, and so the important part is we have an eyelid margin, and we got all the tumor out. So this is, I don't have a final uh, healed picture on this horse, but I have, um, this is a, you know, partial partial healing. So you can see there's a little bit of healing still to go at the eyelid margin, um, but everything's, uh, everything's suctioned down now and has is, is got a nice blood supply from the bottom. Okay, um, so there's, there's things we can do if we don't have enough skin, some a little simpler, some a little fancier, uh, and sometimes we just help the wound grow, um, grow in and, and you know, do its thing slowly too. So antibiotics uh, will depend on the wound and the amount of contamination. So if I have a very clean wound, if I have an area that has a good blood supply, like you know a little little simple wound on the chest, I might not need antibiotics at all. Um, if I think it's maybe a little deeper, maybe it has a little bit more contamination, I might be able to do like um, the oral antibiotics that you can give at home. Pretty simple, pretty common. Uh, anything involving synovial structures or anything that's like very involves a lot of tissue damage, especially on the legs, um, will probably be a candidate for IV antibiotics, and that may be in a hospital too. Um, this last image here is an image of regional limb perfusion. So what this is, is an antibiotic being given to the direct area of the wound. So there's a tourniquet above it and a tourniquet below it, and we're infusing antibiotic in a high concentration right where it's needed. So regional limb perfusion is another possibility there. Now, Hopefully everything goes smoothly in the, in the wound healing process, but there are some complications that can occur. Uh, one of the more common ones being proud flesh. These are some dramatic examples of proud flesh. Not every proud flesh is gonna be huge and obvious like that. Sometimes it's just a little bubble of tissue that's growing over your horse's wound and just won't close. You're like, it, it's almost healed, but it's just not fully healing. Uh, what that is, is that granulation tissue gone crazy. So it's exuberant granulation tissue, uh, meaning for one reason or another, there's just too much inflammation. The horse's uh, wound healing process just kind of got out of control. He's producing this big amount of granulation tissue. Usually this is a problem below the knee, below the hock. It's not an issue on the upper body. If your horse has something like this on the upper body, the head, it's probably not proud flesh. It's probably one of a couple other things. Um, so make sure you have your vet involved. So the main issue with this is that the wound healing can't progress. So it can't grow 
inwards. The skin can't grow inwards from the edges when it's got this big pillow of granulation tissue on top. So we have to take care of that granulation tissue, get that to the edge or the level of the skin for it to be able to fully heal. Another possible complication you could see is uh, seen, especially if you have a lower leg wound um, or anywhere really that the bone is involved and we lose some of the surface layer of the bone. Um, one of the important parts of bone is called the periosteum. It's on the outside of the bone. If we have a wound that involves uh, or goes past that periosteum, the bone loses some of its integrity and some of its uh, nutrient supply. So you're more prone to having a bit of that bone die off and just become disease, necrotic, and, and start its own little infection. Um, and we call that a sequestrum. So if you have a non-healing wound, like uh, like this one in the middle here, it just doesn't look, there's nothing like large about it, but it's, it's draining, it might have some pus coming out. Um, it just is a little bit swollen still. You should check for a sequestrum uh, by taking a radiograph. And here's a picture of a sequestrum here. So here's the bone, and you can see there's a little island of bone that's devitalized. It doesn't have any blood supply. Um, so it's rotting in there. And until we go in and pop that sequestrum out surgically, your horses won't won't ever be able to heal. So this is especially the case when you have a horse with an exposed bone in a laceration. So why do wounds get infected? Infection is the other more obvious uh, type of complication I'm sure you're familiar with. If you have lack of blood supply, like in the lower leg, um, really severe trauma, a large skin flap like this picture uh, here on the right, where you can see a lot of the blood vessels have been torn away from that flap. Um, it's just not a lot of ability for the body to fight off infection if it doesn't have blood supply. Uh, the type of injuries, like a puncture wound, we talked about that debris getting pushed in, uh, crush wounds, anything with a lot of um, lot of damage, location, lower legs, right near the manure, right near the, the ground of the stall, necrotic tissue, and then also uh, foreign material. So a little bit of uh, hair or debris in a wound, uh, even sutures that we put in can act as a, as a foreign body sometimes. And occasionally, sometimes we have a, a little bit of um, wood that finds its way in. So you can see this horse here on the right has a, has a small looking wound. It's not very dramatic looking, um, but he's quite uncomfortable. And if you put a little pressure, we get a, a lot of purulent material leaking out. So we went uh, fishing in there to see why that wound wouldn't heal appropriately and pulled out this, uh, this piece of fence. So this horse had a little extra piece of wood and that was never gonna heal until we got that out. So uh, if the wound isn't healing appropriately, make sure you involve your vet. There may be other things that need to be done. And at this point, Dr. Spizak is gonna talk about what you do once the suturing has been done. All right, so now we are gonna move on to aftercare. So we're gonna talk about what to expect, when to expect it, and when to call us. The short answer before I get into any of my slides is that you should be in communication with us throughout the aftercare phase of your wound. Sometimes this is a few days, sometimes this is a few weeks, a few months, or maybe even years, depending on how um, intense of a wound it is. This is something we can utilize telemedicine for. You can send us pictures. We can do a video chat or talk to you over the phone. Doesn't always have to be an in-person visit, um, but the aftercare phase is definitely where we need to utilize our communication. And like Dr. Latra said, use the thing in your pocket that takes pictures and do a good job of sending those to us. So we're going to talk about a case that we had at the clinic uh, recently. So this is an example of um, a primary closure and a wound that was relatively simple. This is on the leg. Luckily, it's a little bit higher up in the leg. So we're not dealing with um, those lower leg issues in this case that Dr. York spoke about. Um, and this was also, so this was a, a fresh wound. Um, the owners found it very shortly after it happened. You can see that we've got very sharp borders to the, to the wound on the left here. Um, the owners hosed it off as I was on my way out there to see it. Um, of course, this happened on a, on a Sunday. So, you know, that's, that's what horses do for you. Um, so they, they hosed it off and they were prepared and, you know, were able to hold the horse. That's always very helpful. Have somebody there to, to assist the veterinarian, especially if it's on a Sunday. Um, so we, we cleaned this wound, um, and then we surgically closed it. And so this is a primary closure. We did utilize some of those tension relieving techniques in, in this wound 
wound um, just with our suture pattern um, because it is a leg. Like I said, luckily it's not the lower, lower leg, but um, we still want to do some tension relieving patterns. Um, and so the, this middle picture is seven days later. So one week later, our sutures are still in, but you can see things have luckily held together really nicely. Um, the horse was very comfortable. This horse was on antibiotics and pain meds and stall arrest. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we'll, we'll do is we'll give you aftercare instructions. We'll go over that in just a second. Um, but we kept those sutures in for another week. Um, and that, that 14 day check, that's, um, the two weeks later and that horse was good to go at that point. So we removed those sutures that were in the skin and that horse went back to being a good kid's horse and being a good lesson pony. Um, so that is a nice example of a relatively simple wound. But that is still a wound that obviously needed vet care. That wasn't going to heal without that closure. So that's something where this owner did exactly what they were supposed to do. They took a picture of the wound and they called us. Um, and then we were able to go out and treat it. So, um, and that's something we can, you know, we can monitor over time. So um, talking about general care instructions, now this is going to be different for different wounds. So we, you're going to listen to us, listen to your veterinarian um, for each individual wound. But these are some sort of general ballpark things that we're probably going to tell you. So first one is going to be monitoring the wound. Just like you first noticed the wound and you gave us a call and you took those pictures, we want you to monitor that. Usually that's going to be at least every day. It might be more be more than that. We want to know if it's hot to the touch. We want to know if there's new swelling and we want to know if there's discharge, especially if that discharge has like a, a smell or an odor to it. We want to, this is an example, but a lot of times we're going to bandage the wounds. We're going to show you how we want you to bandage the wound. So as an example, we might tell you change the bandage every two days. Um, sometimes it's every day. Sometimes it's less often. Um, but certainly if the bandage becomes wet or soiled, that's a problem because what we want is the the any discharge or material from the wound to wick away from the wound and not keep that wound bed super wet. As well, if that bandage material gets wet from the outside, it can potentially bring contamination and debris into that wound bed that we're trying so hard to keep clean and dry. Um, so these are some other good recommendations. We've got wear gloves when handling the repair, because again, we don't want to introduce anything um, that's new to the wound. Um, and then if needed, we can sort of clean around the wound. These are all going to be things that are going to be specific instructions for each individual wound, but this is just our example. Apply the following ointment. There's a blank there because we're going to tell you specifically. And a reminder, I'm in the aftercare section. You're not going to apply anything until the aftercare portion of the wound, meaning after your veterinarian has seen it and is going to give you that instruction. And then we're going to keep the horse oftentimes um, confined in a stall or small paddock for X number of days. The horse that in that example previously was basically 10 days or two weeks. Some other horses need to be stalled for weeks to months, depending on how severe their wound is. Sutures, if we suture them, we're probably going to tell you that they need to be removed in a certain period of time. Um, and that's something that generally you can either bring the horse in or sometimes we can come out to you. Um, and that will also serve as kind of a recheck exam to make sure that things did what they were supposed to do. Caveat being, if you feel like things aren't going the way they're supposed to do, you need to call us and let us know prior to that suture removal appointment. And then again, like Dr. York mentioned, a lot of times horses are going to be on an antibiotic or an anti-inflammatory medication. We're going to give you those instructions. Please follow those instructions. And then again, recheck exam is very often what we're going to do. All right, we're going to go through another much longer case. This is a um, fun case that we have been dealing with at the clinic with a fantastic owner who is very good at utilizing the thing that takes pictures in her pocket and so send us all kinds of pictures um, and is also great at doing aftercare sort of at home and, and just consulting with us. Um, so the picture on the left is the initial injury. Um, you can see we've, we've got a dirty wound <laughs> clearly um, in a very contaminated area. Um, we didn't know how old this wound was, um, but it definitely didn't happen five minutes ago, right? Um, and we've got this sort of big flap of skin tissue that's hanging down. And so um, we got this picture. We said, yes, please bring that horse to the clinic and let us deal with it. Um, and then this is kind of the initial treatment. So um, this is 
kind of what Dr. York was speaking about, where we've spent a lot of time cleaning this wound. Um, you can see the, the blood on the ground behind the picture of this leg. Um, and we've actually removed that devitalized piece of tissue, that skin flap that was there, because um, you, know, you, you can tell that was never, ever going to, to heal. And um, importantly, um, that circled red structure is actually the horse's bone, um, her cannon bone. Um, so again, very important to kind of fully assess the wound. You can also see her extensor tendon just um, to the bottom right of that red circle. Um, this horse was very lucky in that she didn't get into synovial structures. Um, the front of the leg is sometimes a little bit more forgiving than the back of the lower leg. Um, but this is still a massive wound that you can, you can tell pretty clearly we're not going to be able to suture anything together. So this is a long uh, process of healing. So um, we've got two days later. So you can see um, th this horse has been bandaged. And so these pictures are between bandage changes. But um, you can see we've, we've done a decent job of sort of keeping the wound bed clean and dry. Um, and there's not a whole lot of swelling in the leg. That's the other thing that bandaging often gets us is um, preventing a bunch of that collection of, of fluid and swelling. We've got another four days later. Um, you can see we've got um, kind of a little bit of discharge on the wound. Um, this, uh, you know, spoiler alert, this wound is healing well. And so um, we've got this little bit of discharge, which sometimes can worry us, but um, we sort of, this is one of those things where we need that picture. And we also need you to tell us, is there, um, is there an odor? Is the horse walking well? Does the horse have a fever? All things that we want to know throughout that aftercare phase. We've got two weeks later, we can see a really nice example of granulation tissue forming. You can see that it is mostly covered over where that bone was and where that extensor tendon was. Um, and so it's it's doing its job. It sort of acts as a like a living bandage um, to sort of cover over those structures underneath. We've got a big jump now. We've got two months later on the picture on the right. Um, and so I hope you're getting an idea that this is something that takes a long time. So this horse can't just go back out and do her job a couple weeks after this injury, like the, like the example that we first talked about on the, on the shoulder. Um, so we've got some discoloration here. Um, we can have some um, tissue that becomes dev devitalized throughout that wound healing process. Um, and so we, again, need to sort of see those pictures and talk to you throughout the process. Oftentimes, we will either come out to your farm or have you bring the horse into us to let us do a hands-on exam to evaluate that wound and how it's healing and make sure that they're still on antibiotics and things like that if they need to be. We've got three months later, so you can see a good example um, kind of in these two images of how the wound heals. So um, this is an example of when proud flush doesn't isn't happening. Um, so you can see that we've got that good granulation tissue bed and the skin is sort of creeping downwards um, from top to bottom. So we didn't do a skin graft or anything like this. So we've got to rely on that skin to slowly come together to meet its friends ac you know, across the pond, um, across that granulation tissue. And so what's really important is that the granulation tissue is not higher than the rest of the skin or that we don't get proud flesh or things like that higher than the outside skin because it cannot make that climb. It has to have a nice flat bed to kind of crawl across. Um, and so again, you can see some discoloration here. Um, so again, things can get necrotic or devitalized. Also, sometimes um, certain dressings that we use and things like that can discolor the wound. So we want to we want to know we want you to be only putting on one the, what, on the wound what we tell you to, and we want you to be really honest with us about kind of what you're doing on, to the wound. Um, but we can see that you know from three months to four months, we're getting really nice closure. That skin is slowly making its way down. And then we've got eight months later, we're still working on it. It's looking really good though. Um, and things are closing, 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 but you can see kind of right over that fetlock joint. Um, she's, she's still got some, some to go. And then we've got a big jump. This was fairly recently. Um, this is eight months later. We saw her for something different. Um, and you can see that this is almost a thing of her past, although she is still you know, isn't fully healed, you can tell that something happened to her. So this hopefully gives you an indication that um, we can't expect every wound to heal in, in one week or two weeks. And unfortunately, they don't care if, you know, you've got a, a show or, or a competition or whatever scheduled next month, they're going to heal at their pace. All we can do is what we can do to help them out. 
Um, and that's where that communication is super important. This is, has been a good example of second intention healing, like Dr. York mentioned. So again, we couldn't suture anything in this wound. We had to let her body heal as it was going to heal. All right, so things to watch out for. Um, so we kind of spoke about this already, but it's really important, so I'm repeating it. So signs of infection, that's going to include things like heat, new swelling, um, pain or lameness, especially like if it wasn't there before and the horse is suddenly painful in that area or off on that leg, that's something we absolutely need to know about because there's a risk that there is an infection or that um, things have moved deeper in than they were previously. Pus or purulent material and any type of, of foul smell. That includes when you're doing bandage changes. Oftentimes there's going to be some type of discharge or, or material on that inner layer of bandage. You want to look at that. I know it might be a little bit gross, but when you take that bandage off, you want to look at the inside of the bandage material and just make sure that it it looks like you, you know it's it's always been looking and like you expect it to. Um, if the, the wound is not sort of closing and moving together on its own, like it has been, or like we have indicated that we expect it to, please let us know. And then proud flesh, Dr. York had a, a more, um, obvious example of proud flesh, but this is another example of proud flesh. And so you can see that there's just this elevated middle of the wound that that skin around it is never going to close over. Here are some helpful things to have at home. Um, again, you know, when we see your horse for a wound and we send it home, we're going to go over um, what we'd like you to put on it, um, cover it with all of those things. But these are just some generally helpful things to have around if you've got horses. So um, topical antibiotic ointments, um, specifically like a triple antibiotic, neosporin, something like that, and SSD. You see the big stars there. Please only use those when directed, but triple antibiotic ointment and SSD are generally um, the things we're going to recommend somewhat regularly. Um, sterile gauze pad and gauze bandage. These are for things like bandage changes that, that we'll kind of go over with you. Um, a quilter, cotton roll for padding, standing wraps, vet wraps, elasticon, um, and potentially like a standing support bandage or something like that. Um, diapers, like Dr. Lauter talked about, and duct tape or Gorilla Tape, depending on your preference. Um, these two products on the right here are things that we use pretty regularly and we really, really like. Um, the uh, middle picture of the sort of lattice bandage, that's called an equine sleeve. Um, we really, really like those um, for, for bandaging because it makes the bandage changes quite easy. Because um, you can see we've got a bandage on this horse's leg, um, and then there's an equine sleeve kind of placed over top of it to sort of hold everything in. Um, these are like a, it's like a stretchy material um, that doesn't, doesn't really get dirty. And so we can almost keep them on the horse's leg and just roll them down, do the bandage change and roll them back up. Um, and then uh, socks for horses, they're silver impregnated. And so they're really, really good to help with healing. Um, so both of those are products that we might be recommending during that aftercare phase of the wound healing. And then little, um, push out there for the Spring Hill Equine YouTube channel. Dr. Latcher, I think a year ago, did a really, really good video on bandaging wounds um, where she goes over um, uh, general types of bandaging. She does a hawk bandage, which is one of the hardest things to bandage, um, as well as goes into a lot more detail about sort of what material to have on hand. Um, also, if you haven't checked out the YouTube channel recently and seen the Horse Girl Goes to a Vet series, you have to check that out. Funniest thing I've seen in months. Um, so yeah, those are our plugs for our Spring Hill Equine YouTube channel. We've got lots of other good information, um, as well as where we post our seminars. All right. Um, and then, uh, thank you guys for coming. I'll see if we've got any questions, but just a reminder that we've got a nutrition seminar coming up next month, April 20th. Um, we are going to cover horse nutrition as well as dog and cat nutrition in that seminar. Okay, I think I think I'm on. You can you can stay. <laughs> okay. together. So we have a bit of a complicated question that I'm going to get to in a second. But first question we're going to talk about was: um, Do we ever use cadaver skin? And we don't really use cadaver skin. I'm not entirely sure if I can tell you. I think it's a a supply problem because you can't just take the skin off. You have to process it and do things with it for it to be ready to go on to you know from one horse to another. What we do use a lot of is amnion. So when we have a full born, we will take not the placenta part, but the, the kind of the white part of the, the 
after birth. Uh, we have to do some magic to it. It gets soaked. It's like a 57 step process. Then we can freeze those sheets and they can go on over top of the, the wound bed and they bring a lot of healing. Um, to a wound and they help us get it to heal faster. But the skin graft, like Dr. York talked about, is a great way on these big wounds that we're trying to get to heal. Like the, the wound that you went over, it, that would have been a great one for a skin graft. Um, the problem is they, they cost a decent amount of money. So you can either do time or dollars, but sometimes <laughs> you got to pick one. Yeah. Um, the other question is about a horse who has a longstanding wound that they're having trouble healing. And so much like you talked about, we want to make sure that wound isn't infected. If it's in an area where there's bone, um, we want to x-ray it on a regular basis to make sure we don't have an underlying bone issue going on. Uh, and then there's always the just the movement problem. And that's where sometimes putting them in cast on that area, so a lower leg cast for a short term can get a wound to really heal for us because we stop all movement. Casts come with a wide variety of difficulties when it comes to horses, so it's not something we approach lightly. But if we have a wound that we can't come up with any other reason why it's not healing, a cast may be our, our next go-to to handle that high motion joint. So hopefully that answered your question. That was definitely, that's one where you need to have your veterinarian involved to really check things out and, and make sure there isn't a good reason why that wound isn't healing for you. So are there other questions from? That's it. Okay. If we, you suddenly think of a question and it's three in the morning, feel free to drop it down below and we'll get, get it to you. Otherwise, we'll see you guys on April 20th.